In the name of God, amen. Like a lot of you, I like to consult a few commentaries before I preach, and this time around, the best commentary wasn't done on a page, but on a canvas. Have a look. This is The Calling of St. Matthew by Caravaggio. You will recognize Jesus and Peter on the right. The young guy with the black and white striped sleeves is a bodyguard. I'll say more about the other four figures in a moment. Sometimes an image makes visible lessons we don't necessarily find in a text, no matter how many times we've read it. This particular painting makes several things jump out at me, and I wanted to share them with you. The first is that Jesus goes into dangerous places. If you were a Jewish man drawing large crowds for any reason in the Roman Empire, you were under suspicion. So Jesus was no stranger to risk, even before his final entry into Jerusalem. And he's at risk here. The room in which Matthew and his associates have met is dark. It's private. It's out of the way. The business they are conducting requires a bodyguard. And let's take a look at the bodyguard. He's leaning forward. He's reaching for his weapon. He's ready to spring. Jesus and Peter would have known they were at risk before they entered the room. But they went anyway because someone in that room had a calling, and who else was going to let him know? The second point is that Jesus does not get everyone's attention. Despite what must have been a dramatic entrance, not all eyes are on him. The Son of God is standing in the corner of the room and the guy in the fur and glasses at the upper left is still looking at the money on the table. The seated figure in the brightly striped sleeves is also staring at the table, clutching a purse and fingering coins. Even the bearded man with his eyes on Jesus still has his hands on the money he is counting. Even in God's presence, People can decide that they have other things to do, other commitments to maintain, other business to transact. It probably goes without saying that at various times in our lives, we have all been such people. But we are fortunate because, and here is my third point, Jesus interrupts people. This painting captures an intrusion Whatever one thinks of the crew at the table, they are going about their business, and Jesus and Peter just show up to disrupt the proceedings. They invite themselves in and tell one of the men he is needed and it's time to go. None of these guys woke up on the morning of this encounter thinking, boy, it would be great if I were to be called to a life-changing adventure of unfathomable spiritual depth. But that's what happened. I'm not suggesting that every call to follow Jesus is sudden and dramatic. None of us walk around in a world lit as dramatically as this painting. I'm only saying that the promptings of God are often unexpected and dislocating. They come when we are doing other things that had previously given our lives shape and purpose. A fourth lesson I draw from this painting is that God calls seemingly unpromising people into divine service. Again, I ask you to look at these men. They are seekers after riches and status. Only one has so much as lifted his eyes to acknowledge Jesus' presence. They may not have been regarded as Matthew, the tax collector, surely was, as a man who preyed upon people of Israel for the benefit of the Roman Empire and his own enrichment. But we are not looking at Francis of Assisi and his original followers either. Yet here, Jesus, with his luminous outstretched hand saying, you're with me now. One of the mysteries of this painting is which of these men Jesus is calling. Most scholars seem to believe it is the bearded man with the upraised hand, the idea being that he's pointing to his own chest as if to say, 
Are you talking to me? Or perhaps more likely, you can't possibly be talking to me, can you? Others think Jesus is pointing at our friend across the table with the striped sleeves and the downcast eyes. They believe that all of the many pointing fingers in this painting are pointed at him, and that what we're seeing is the moment before he lifts his eyes from the work that has defined him and understands that his life is about to be transformed. Now, as you may know, I'm not an art historian. I learned what I know about this painting using time-honored tools of historical research, by which I mean Google and YouTube. So I'm not going to venture an interpretation, but if you will indulge my fascination with this painting just a little further, I ask you to imagine yourself as one of the characters at the table. When the divine comes into your midst, are you crouched and defensive, ready with your weapon? Are you wary, like the boy in gold and red who's leaning against the bearded man for protection? Do you sense the significance of the moment but wonder if God could possibly be calling you? Do you find yourself unable to pay proper attention because you are so focused on the task at hand? Or do you find that you can't take your eyes off things you can count? Now shift to the other side of the room. It may be uncomfortable to imagine yourself as Jesus. Well, I, I hope it's uncomfortable for you to imagine yourself as Jesus. So, all right, let's look at Peter instead. He is calling whichever of these men Christ means to call. He is summoning. It's something a little firmer than an invitation, isn't it? It's more like you, now. In a few hours, the House of Deputies will elect my successor, and on Monday, I will end my 10 years of service as president. It's a time when people ask you retrospective sorts of questions, such as, which of the many things that happened during my long tenure am I proudest of? I have a list. I have a list. Not, not really. I don't really have a list. I was thrilled and honored to be in the chair when the House of Deputies approved the resolutions that made marriage equality a reality in most of the dioceses of our church in 2015. I was gratified by the work I helped initiate through the Me Too Committee that served in advance of the 2018 General Convention. And I am in hopes that the creation of the Episcopal Coalition for Racial Equity and Justice through the passage of Resolution A125 will be among the most significant actions this church has ever taken. But what I am proudest of are the people I have had the opportunity to call into leadership. There has been a generational change in our church. The houses of General Convention are more racially diverse than they ever have been. A new generation of young leaders is on the rise in our legislative committees, thanks in part, I would like to think, to the creation of additional leadership positions, which I filled exclusively with younger deputies. At this convention, we are focusing special attention on the House of Deputies Committee on the State of the Church, which was composed almost entirely of millennial leaders. And while I do not know who the House of Deputies will elect as my successor, I do know that thanks to the decision reached at the 79th General Convention to compensate the person who holds this position, you will be choosing from the youngest and most diverse slate in the church's history. We've made significant progress in opening leadership positions in the House of Deputies to people who might previously have been excluded. But more remains to be done, because if one learns anything in this job, which involves making hundreds and hundreds of appointments, it is that the spirit not only blows where it will, but upon whom it will, like this guy, or maybe this one. So before my term ends, and I begin my new career in art history, I want to offer a simple prayer 
that you, like Matthew, may know what it is to be called into divine service, and that you may also know what it is to call others. Remember, though, that when you tell someone to follow you, you need to be going somewhere. A movement requires a direction. So if we can look at our painting one last time, you will notice that Jesus' feet are facing towards the door. The heel of his right foot is already lifted. He is moving, my friends, and so must we. Amen.